Hi, everybody. Welcome on back. Folks, a chance to turn their cans back on if they'd like. Hope you had a nice stretch and a nice break. We have something to drink. All right. So uh, for the next hour, we get to talk in detail about the effects of climate change on tribes around the country, the varying effects on health primarily, but other impacts as well. So we have before the next hour. Now this could be somewhat interactive. We're gonna ask you to interact over chat mainly through this portion. Then like I said, when we come back together after lunch, um, we get to talk all about our experiences with these exposures that we're gonna walk through and their impacts on health um, and other types of impacts on our community. So it's a good time to just kind of sit back um, for just a little while. So we usually like to start these conversations with um, just an acknowledgement that tribes have always known that there are countless ways that the health of their communities and the health of their environment are interlinked, that the health of the environment affects health and well-being. And as our global climate is changing, we are all experiencing just how much life on Earth depends on, is shaped by, and unfortunately affects our climate. And we are seeing all over the place, more and more, in the six years we've been doing this, a huge shift in the level of urgency around the health impacts of climate change. And the biggest medical journals and even mainstream media, um, all the way to the latest IPCC report, International Panel of Climate Change, says the climate change is the biggest health threat of the 21st century. Um, there was another article that I like to cite a lot, uh, an academic article that said, a stable climate is the most fundamental determinant of human health. Now think about that. Um, at least in this person's opinion, it was about poverty and violence. Climate change is, or climate is the most fundamental determinant of health. So when we talk about health, we, um, we aren't just talking about Western medicine, especially for tribes who want to look more holistically at, well, at well-being. Uh, they have a long legacy of respect and stewardship of the environment and considering the impacts on future generations. And you know, we've been doing this a while, talking directly with um, tribes all across the country, and they relate to us all of, we hear all the time, the balance and harmony of people in the environment. It feels like it's slipping away. Next slide, please. Oh, actually, I'm controlling. <laughs> so, you know, we've been at this a long time, um, doing this for six years. And in that process, having looked across, you know, talking to all, all, all different tribes across the country, experts looking at the literature, looking at the data, um, having formed this framework for the Tribal Climate Health Project that really instructs a lot of our content. So the framework's on the left and it illustrates the cascading impacts of climate change and how communities can protect their assets from harmful impacts. And when I say assets, I mean that very broadly, anything that the community has that it wants, to, that it values and it wants to protect. So um, for example, you know, com communities that expect greater levels of flooding may look out for um, for a variety of impacts. So this, this diagram takes us from all the climate drivers on the left up to exposures. And it talks about the five key exposures. Um, we'll, uh, for Tribal Climate Health Project, we have categorized those five primary exposures as temperature extremes, wildfire, storms and flooding, drought, and melting ice and sea level rise. That uh, climate change is inducing those exposures. Um, those exposures are triggering secondary exposures. Exposures meaning something that is changing in the condition of the climate that your community will come into contact with. Um, those are triggering um, secondary exposures in, and presenting themselves in different ways, but generally worsened air quality, vector changes, water insecurity, and food insecurity. So those are the secondary exposures that we talk about. 
And uh, of all those exposures, those present those sometimes they affect each other. They look differently when they affect each other. We're going to walk through all of those. So in the next uh, for the next hour, we're going to talk through these five exposures and talk about what secondary exposures um, they create and which impacts are associated with each of these exposures. We're going to focus mainly on health, but the impacts generally fall within an impact to your natural environment, an impact to your built environment, or an impact to your health and social environment. And like I said, we look more holistically at health than sometimes uh, Western science might. We look at human health from a physical and mental perspective. We look at cultural and spiritual health. We look at socioeconomic health. And that's because we know um, that indigenous health is based upon an interconnection between social and ecological systems um, that are being disrupted by climate change. So for example, communities can expect you know, a greater, greater levels of flooding, we want them to make sure that they know to look out for things like contaminated water and indoor mold spores. But not every exposure is going to be applicable to every community or to the same extent. So depending where you are in the country, you're going to have a much different experience. Exposures and these exposures and impacts are, are interrelated. So for example, heat and drought create conditions that are more susceptible to wildfire and flood, and they have impacts on the natural and built environment that often eventually help affect the health and social system. So, you know, our big epiphany after doing this work for so long is that health is really at the center of it all. At some point down the line, if you run these scenarios of impacts far enough, you'll be able to identify some level of impact on quality of life or well being that's going to affect um, all of us. This is another way to look at the big picture uh, where our five key exposures are there on the outside, the secondary exposures on the second loop there. And then inside are the four ways that we really look at health. We look at physical health, mental health, socioeconomic health, and cultural and spiritual health. And so just to give you some examples of the kinds of health we're, we're gonna be talking about under each exposure, we look at illness, of course we do. It's a that's a big part of health. So things like heat-related illness, mortality, worse than chronic disease, asthma, respiratory illness, vector-borne diseases, even down to things like um, folks that are dependent on elect electrical equipment, say dialysis, that might be at risk because climate change may uh, result in power outages or instability, unreliable power. The thing that I think makes Tribal Climate Health Project and a lot of tribal work look very differently than some other work is uh, looking at the effects of, on culture. So we look at cultural and spiritual health, things like loss of hunting areas, relocation of villages, canceled ceremonies, impacts to traditional farming, effects on traditional species, destroyed gathering areas, and just generally the intense vulnerability associated with those of you that have um, treaty rights um, and sand to have impacts to your sovereignty uh, and your continued um, ability to exist on your lands. So like I said, you know, we're going to talk about this, but y'all are coming from all different parts of the country. Um, tribes are um, are managing these different climate effects very differently. And they also manage to protect and restore uh, hundreds of thousands of square feet of land across the United States. So, you know, in the Northwest, we see changes in the timing of stream flow and reduced water supplies that, you know, are dealing with competing demands, uh, sea level rise, erosion, inundation, risk to infrastructure, uh, increasing ocean acidity, uh, increasing wildfire, insect outbreaks, tree disease, uh, in Alaska, we have, I know we have Alaska folks here today. I want to hear more from what you all are experiencing. We hear a lot about permafrost thawing, erosion, and impacts to traditional hunting practices. Uh, Navajo, these are just picking out a few examples. Navajo, we hear a lot about heat and water insecurity in Mojave. They are dealing with a shrinking river, which has impacts on their spiritual health and their ability to do their traditional practices. Um, in Florida, dealing with hurricanes and sea level rise. Some of you on the 
on the West Coast as well. Dakota, we've heard um, stories about bomb cyclones and these terrible storms and floods, um, more extreme than they had ever experienced. And so that's what we're going to walk through next. We're just going to walk through exposure by exposure, just what we know from reading uh, across a lot of different tribal experiences, talking to tribes, looking at some of the best reports across the country. Just what do we know about the impacts of each of these exposures? We're going to start with temperature extremes. And so, you know, this. It's, it's, it's organized to help you understand how each exposure may impact your community. Um, so temperature extremes, we often talk about heat, but you know, cold events are part of temperature extremes too. Um, but high temperature records are far outnumbering low temperature records. So uh, we oftentimes we focus on heat. Um, according to the 2017 Climate Science Special Report, annual average temperatures in the United States uh, are, have already increased 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit from 1895 to 2016. Um, they are projected to increase by the end of the century another 2.8 to 7.3 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, I think some people still think maybe that those are not an extreme. Those aren't extreme. You know, we we see waves and variations in temperature far greater than that. And, um, you know, we can manage it. But if we're talking about a consistent average overall projected increase, um, we're talking about significant impacts. And we're gonna talk more about that. Now, what, what comes along with temperature extremes is also uh, a, a susceptibility to seasonal shifts, more extreme heat and cold events and sea temperature changes. So season shifts, meaning our, our planting season changes, the blooming seasons are changing, the allergy seasons are changing, the uh, seasonality around breeding of certain species is changing. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So who's affected? Well, pretty much everybody around the country and around the world is going to be um, affected by warming temperatures and in some cases, extreme cold. But particularly, uh, those of us in the Southwest are considered to be most vulnerable uh, to extreme heat. And uh, raise your hand here, give me a hand raise if you feel like you've experienced more extreme heat in the last decade or so. Yes, I see some hands raising. So yeah, I would be surprised if anybody didn't raise your hand. And so just, you know, be thinking and throw something in the chat here, knowing that this is already here, we already have experienced temperature increases. What health impacts might you anticipate? And just drop some thoughts in the chat. And we're not, we have a lot to get through, so I'm gonna keep going. But you might be thinking some of some things we haven't quite thought about. Here's some of the possible health impacts. Um, of course, heat-related illness. So that might look like heat cramps, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, hyperthemia, uh, or worsening of chronic conditions, such as cardiovascular disease. Any of these things could lead to premature mortality. Also looking at a decrease in fitness activity level. So as, and this happens to me actually quite often, even though I'm sitting in one of the most temperate places in the entire country, um, we don't have air conditioning where I live. Most homes don't have it. And, um, but when it's a hot day or rare, really hot days, uh, it has meant we can't get outside. We might have to stay indoors and you all experience probably this much worse than me, but I'll tell you in the pandemic where we didn't have a lot of options, to go indoors other places, the ability to get outside was sacred. Um, but we do see the data showing that folks will just not be able to get outside and their fitness act le activity level may actually be affected. An important component of health. Uh, we see impacts to mental health, meaning mental, behavioral, and cognitive disorders are seen to be exacerbated by heat waves, by lack of access to outdoor activities as well. 
uh, all of those things that contribute to well-being and um, can lead to things like increased conflict, violence, and aggression in communities. Power outages, um, we just talked about that a little bit, but they limit access to services that protect health. So that could mean um, in a widespread, so say a brownout, a heat wave where folks are using a lot of air conditioning all around the grid, uh, losing power might mean you don't have access to your own air conditioning, that you don't have access to maybe your, I mean, if a, if a critical facility no longer has um, electricity that's bad in a lot of ways, um, and particularly, like we said, for those that are electricity dependent on things like dialysis or something else that needs to be plugged in. Um, the other thing that we hear is that, you know, when folks lose power, then they're on backup generators using potentially diesel, and those can contribute to things like carbon monoxide poisoning if not, um, if not operated carefully. So what else? Let's see. I'm trying to get my chat back up on my screen here. Did anybody suggest anything else? Yeah, we're going to talk about some of these secondary exposures in just a second. Poverty, mental health, yep, suicide, intense smoke. Yeah, we'll get to that. That's for sure. Poverty is enhanced. Yes, thank you. Sleep and rest is impacted when it's too hot outside. That's for sure. River temperatures increase in killing our sea, otter, sea critters. That's right. We're going to talk mainly uh, about human health impacts, but I certainly want to hear about what you're seeing in the natural environment because we believe that that's critical to human health as well and our well being. So some related exposures, how does temperature extreme affect some of these other exposures we talked about? Well, it contributes, of course, to wildfire and drought. Uh, wildfire is often uh, more, you know, we're more susceptible to wildfire when our fuels have dried out, and that oftentimes can happen in heat. Temperature extremes can also affect um, the strength and viability of our vegetation and uh, their ability to withstand other extreme temperatures um, leading to higher propensity for drought, I'm sorry, higher propensity for wildfire. And then of course, um, soil, uh, soil moisture levels deplete faster in temperature extremes as well when heat is very high. So we might see um, impacts to greater levels of droughts. So it's all connected, right? And it also triggers secondary exposures. So that icon means we see some impacts to worsened air quality. When it comes to rising temperatures, there's a correlation between high, uh, higher heat levels and higher levels of ground level ozone. So on the right there, you see a little map that's showing part of Southern California where we already have ozone, ground level ozone concerns. Um, and when we have higher levels of heat, the level of ground level ozone also increases, which is, a really great way to get more respiratory effects. Like I said, with the seasonality changes and the differences in, um, in uh, plant distribution, we see different levels of pollen in the air, allergens. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we see different breeding levels and distribution of ticks and mosquitoes due to temperature changes. Um, and then we also see changes to water contamination and water supply disruption. So for example, you know, to the extent heat relates to drought, we're gonna have a supply disruption, but also the warming waters are also more susceptible to pathogens that might lead to contamination and meaning it could affect your ability to recreate, it could affect your ability to drink the water. Um, and the same thing can happen foods, you know, without proper storage, food spoiling can occur. Um, and Big, big picture, we think about what happens to our food supply as temperature extremes continue in the long run. Um, we're talking about major impacts to our ability to manage and grow crops. So what health imp impacts do you anticipate from these secondary exposures? We're sort of leading to some of them already. Um, I'm curious, so drop those in the chat as well. Angie, this is Shasta, and I've I've been monitoring and and doing the chat, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just shout out a few of these. Yeah. Um. You know the algae blooms. You know that's a temperature thing. The water gets warmer. The algae gets algier, <laughs> sucks the oxygen out, poisons the shellfish, makes it harder for the fish to spawn. Um. Then we get the mosquitoes in those warm pools of water, and and uh, 
Uh, Teresa mentioned that, and uh, Celso mentioned reptile and bee activity increasing. And I'm wondering if that's like, are the snakes coming out earlier? And, um, you know, especially if you're talking about venomous snakes like uh, rattlesnakes, um, is that's potentially uh, an issue for people getting in trouble with, with snakes. Um, yeah, skin cancer, gardening, you know, gardens not making it. Uh, me and Debbie were commiserating that our squash has not done well in the sun this year. So yeah, people are coming up with a lot of great stuff in the chat. Thank you and keep it coming. Keep it coming. So, you know, we talked about vectors, seasonality of vectors and the breeding of vectors. So, you know, you used to think of things like Lyme disease over on the right being more of an East Coast problem, that's changing. So if Lyme disease is something you hadn't been looking at before because you're in an area where you didn't think it ticks were a big problem, that that may be changing. So you know, we're starting to prep you to think through what might go into a vulnerability assessment, right? A vulnerability assessment is all about where are the vulnerabilities, what risks are coming, um, and to know what they are, to take off the blindfold and really look at them. So Lyme disease, you might have to rethink whether or not your community is at risk for Lyme disease. Um, you know, we talked about respiratory illnesses, um, aller allergic symptoms from pollen. The data on here is getting better and better. Uh, but not great. It's still difficult to say for any particular community if you think that you're, you know, you're you're allergic. Your the actual health outcomes of pollen are being felt, and to what extent? Because not everybody runs to the hospital, and so we don't have the data to really back it up. Um, but we do see uh, infectious infections and illness from contaminated food and water. So there's those algal blooms. And yes, thank you for mentioning that. We. We would love to hear more about your experiences with algal blooms, especially in those um, round tables that we're going to have next. And then, you know, to the extent those of you that are reliant upon your local or tribal sustenance, um, you may experience immediately a lack of nutritional and medicinal abundance um, if you are reliant upon your own crop or harvest. Uh, folks like you know, at Paula, they're in a more urbanized area, having access to a more global food system. But, um, you know, there's vulnerabilities there too, to the extent that food systems, um, we, we see shortages in certain things or the distribution might not be able to be, um, might, might not be able to be uh, completed. All right, let's move because we've got a lot to talk about. What about potential impacts to socio social, economic, and cultural health? Well, there's a lot. Um, so for temperature extremes, we would be looking at things like displacement. So is there a point at which it becomes too warm for people to want to continue to live in a space uh, on certain lands? Does it become uninhabitable or at least so devastatingly uncomfortable people say, nope, I gotta go. On the, on the right there, you see climate change induced migration. That's actually a EPA projection for what they think that uh, climate, how folks are gonna move around the country uh, by 2050 and by 2090. And you can see percent change in red here. And where people are likely to, to go to, and blue is where they're likely to, uh, I'm sorry, red is where they're leaving, blue is where they're going. And so that you can see changes in migration now. Everybody's, this is sort of interesting for everybody, for, for tribes, of course, displacement has a lot of other implications, devastating implications if it comes to um, things like uh, sovereignty and your rights in community cohesion and the continuation of your cultural traditions. Uh, we'd also be looking at things like lost school days, uh, lost business days, right? Uh, disruptions to your culturally important activities and species. So. Um, things like your outdoor activities. I've heard countless times from tribes that they can't do their summer their summer outdoor activity, whether that's a, a powwow or um, another gathering. I, I used to work with another tribe that um, their lake basically um, turned into just like a bamboo um, vegetated area, and that was their primary gathering space, and they no longer can use it. They, they used to like to do picnics down there and they just can't use it anymore. Um, and what else, right? Tell us more in the chat about what other cultural and well-being, cultural well-being and traditional ways of life are being disrupted by temperature extremes. 
Um, it's really important to talk about these economic impacts as well. So we think that a really important part of well-being is continuation of your livelihood and the ability to continue to, uh, to maintain your economic drivers. So uh, for example, in the, in the California, in California, our fourth climate change assessment, uh, it said by 2050, high ambient temperatures are estimated to result in $50 billion a year in additional costs. Then that's just associated with human mortality resulting from high temperatures. So there's costs to that are associated with our health, but there's just general costs as well, especially when we're talking about things like power outages. How is that going to affect our ability to continue our economic drivers? So lost business revenues. Um, and that might affect, especially those of you in hospitality and agriculture that depend on those revenues. Chester, are you seeing anything interesting in this chat you want to mention on cultural well-being and traditional ways of life? Uh, there's so much going on in the chat that I, I can't even keep up. You all are amazing. And we will have a transcript of the chat that we can clean up and send out so people can see uh, some of these, these great comments. Um, I'll just reiterate one that uh, George from Santa Isabel put in that we're, we're having impacts to the oak trees and for folks who are gathering acorn and making we wish um, or shawi, depending on if you're kumiai or uh, payom kuwicham, <laughs> you can't get to the more vulnerable to pest infestations and heat and drought. Um, so, and like Celso just said, when Mother Earth is overheated, we feel the effects of her temperature. She's got a fever and, and, and it makes us all sick. We like to start with wildfire because it triggers a lot of other things. And we're going to talk about those. Um, thank you. Keep this coming. Like I said, this is a warm up because you get to really talk to each other soon. All right. Let's talk about wildfire. Raise your hand if you've been affected by a wildfire in the last three years or actually give a thumbs up because when you put your hand up you end up forgetting to take it down <laughs> oh, ah, okay thumbs up or a thumbs down really since nobody wants to experience yeah, right. actual, uh human caused wildfire yes 13 so thumbs you use your... at least so there's a sad face yeah. more thumbs <laughs> yeah whatever reaction you want you go to reactions to do that yeah, billy hawk raised a hand and a thumb <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Some of you actually, if anybody is dealing with one right now, throw that That's in the chat. Put a fire emoji. Perfect. There you go. That's the one. All right. Awesome. So let's, let's talk about it. You know, personal experience is going to be king here, but let's talk about what the research says. Um, so according to the, that same climate science special report, the incidence of large forest fires in the Western US and Alaska um, are, have been increasing significantly since the early 1980s are projected to further increase in those regions as the climate warms with profound changes to certain ecosystems, right? So as we see more fuel, um, fuel meaning what dried out vegetation is really good at burning. As we see more of that, we're seeing more changes, more susceptibility to wildfire. Um, we're also seeing longer burn seasons. Uh, pretty much everybody I know in California just says there is no burn season. It's all year long. Uh, however, we're just, I think we're starting our most intense period probably right about now. So regions affected primarily Alaska, Northwest and Southwest. What health impacts not only can you anticipate, but have you already experienced? Let's talk about it. Uh, obviously wildfire related injury and death. Uh, those of you that you probably remember back in 2018, it was um, the deadliest fire in California history. 86 people died at the campfire in paradise, California. California gets a lot of a lot of headlines around wildfire, but we're not alone. It's happening in a lot of the parts of the Western United States and in Alaska. I live um, pretty close to those deadly debris flows that happened in Montecito after our Big Thomas fire. So I don't live in Montecito, but I live nearby enough that this community will never forget uh, the 20 people that died and the devastating economic damage that was done. And a lot of, actually in our community, a lot of folks rallied around mental health. Um, and so, you know, the mental health impacts uh, can be not just not just immediate, but severe when immediate, but also can last a long time, including post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, and grief. 
there's a study by Rand uh, that found that one third of the adult survivors of California wildfires in 2003 um, suffered depression and one quarter suffered PTSD. So, you know, the impacts might also, to mental health can also include, you know, the less access to outdoor activities. I've been in areas where it was weeks before you could go back outside because the air quality was so bad. Um, damage to economic drivers, this anxiety around our economy. Um, certainly for those, especially that might be dealing with, um, or, you know, anticipating reliable revenues from things like even logging. I know that some tribes do that. And then damage to or closure of infrastructure that limits access to health services. Um, so that could look like a power outage. That could look like a closure because the fire is too close. And so say you can't access an actual hospital, um, you might not be able to get the health, health service. Or, and we actually, Chasta, you might wanna talk about this for a second, our transportation, adaptation plan that we recently did for Paula, we talked a lot about the impacts of wildfire just in terms of the inability to be mobile for emergency crews to come in, for people to get out, if people feel trapped. Do you wanna talk at all about that? Sure, uh, yeah, and it's, it's, I think probably a common experience that especially our rural communities don't have the same ability to escape because they have very few roads into and out of those communities. And so in Paula, we have one main road, Highway 76, and then a smaller road that goes north into the community of Temecula. And if there's fire on 76 and it's closed, um, same thing going north, then, then you're trapped. Uh, and that's, that's a high level of anxiety for people not knowing if they're going to be able to escape. Uh, thankfully, we've had some grant money to be able to do some fire mitigation work with uh, weed cutting and creating defensible zones around roads. We also have a, a transportation specific climate change adaptation plan. And so we're working on those things. But the reality is, is that if there's fire to the north, fire to the south, fire to the west and fire to the east, then we have nowhere that, that we can go. Uh, so it's it's really something that needs to be addressed, um, and that even that and that even becomes an issue too. You might have to evacuate if you're in uh, a geographic zone. And Paula is like this, where we're in a valley, and if wildfire smoke comes in and creates a layer over the reservation, it's not safe to breathe. Um, and so those are other reasons to have to be able to. Um, to have a, a basically an evacuation plan. It's not just the flames that, that will hurt you, it's the smoke. Right, let's talk about that. So those are just the direct impacts of the actual wildfire, but of course wildfire is going to contribute to some other exposures. It contributes to storms and flooding, right? So next time after a big wildfire, a storm, a large storm comes, severe you know, precipitation, um, you might see things like landslides, erosion, mudslides, debris flows, like I mentioned, it also triggers secondary exposures. So all four of them in different ways, they all present themselves uniquely, but wildfire obviously contributes to worsened air quality through smoke and particulate matter. And that smoke contains a lot of things, not just particulate matter, including things that are toxic. Um, we see changes to ticks and forest pests in the aftermath of a wildfire. We see water contamination, water supply to disruption. So for example, if you're a tribe that might actually even need to dip into its own domestic water supplies to fight a fire, then you're really in trouble. Uh, or if you have impacts to the, uh, to the water quality after the wildfire, uh, it might affect your drinking supplies as well. Food contamination and supply disruption as well. Here, we're really concerned about supplies being able to get in and out of an area that might um, no longer have mobility. So if there are closures uh, to roads or just services being down. So you're probably thinking about all these health impacts. The most obvious one that people think about is respiratory and cardiovascular illness. So exposure to smoke-related air pollutants, including particulate matter from wildfire, has been associated with a wide range of human effects. So the strongest evidence for acute respiratory illness uh, people go to the hospital, right? You may have seen this. It's hard sometimes to get the data to see 
how many more people might go to the hospital for uh, an emergency when it comes to the respiratory health. Uh, but that's something we're looking to do a little bit better. We're looking to grab that data. And that smoke hazard can last for weeks. And as you all know, it goes for miles. You don't have to be near a fire to actually feel the impacts of the smoke. Um, there are some good places to go for information, real-time information on air quality, including places like AirGov, uh, airnow.gov, which I'm using before I go to my trip uh, to Mammoth this weekend. Um, but also valley fever. We're going to talk a little bit more about valley fever, but valley fever is something that um, we hear about quite a bit uh, in the southwest. We're hearing about it more and more. It's a fungal disease that um, it typically it might get kicked up and travel through the dust and smoke of a wildfire. Um, we're hearing, we are seeing that the levels are increasing among tribal communities, uh, cases of valley fever. Again, there's a relationship between places that have been burned during a wildfire and Lyme disease. Uh, let's see, what do we have here on the right? We're showing, oh, this is respiratory. So this is asthma on the right is, upper right is asthma, um, emergency department visits for asthma and areas and populations vulnerable to predicted surface smoke from wildfire. So those are related to smoke, all different ways that you can look for vulnerability. We're gonna talk more about how to look at your own community and see how vulnerable you are. Um, we, have the, we have a few places to do that. So we talked about drinking water supply interruption. Um, we already mentioned those things and then lack of nutritional and medicinal, medicinal abundance. So to the extent that some of your crops may even burn, um, that's another way that you can potentially see a health impact. What else is happening in chat? Anything that we wanna raise? We see are uh, telling people about that uh, Hard to say new words, solastalgia about uh, the the anxiety and depression associated with climate change and environmental um, degradation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I'm so happy to see you active here on chat. Great. And I'll also I'll just give a, a quick time check. We've got about 23 minutes left before lunch, and I know we have three more impacts to go through. Or These are going to start. Of. Yeah. Exactly. These are going to start getting repetitive, so I'm not going to go in as much detail. So we started to talk about some of these things already. So possible impacts of social, economic, and cultural health. You know, in the chat, be dropping any ideas you have about how wildfire has affected your cultural well-being and traditional ways of life. Um, of course, displacement and destruction of historical and cultural sites and assets is a concern. So yeah, yeah, you might see damage to businesses and homes and critical facilities, but also to potentially a, a, a burial ground or, or some other significant cultural landmark. Disruptions to culturally important activities and species. So say, you know, maybe oaks are critical, you know, critically important cultural species for you, for your tribe. Um, and we may see decimation of some of those oaks, uh, probably already infested by bark beetles uh, in places, especially here in California, now potentially burning. Again, loss of school days and business revenues, economic damages. Um, we have seen in Southern California, you know, some of the hospitality um, businesses that are owned by tribes that have had to close in the event of a wildfire, losing significant revenues. All right, storms and flooding. So um, this one's kind of tricky to talk about on a national level. So severe storms are um, include increased extreme rainfall, snowfall events, an upward trend in tropical cyclone activities, including North Atlantic hurricanes and more viable thunderstorm events. So including wind, hail and tornadoes. So it just looks, storms and flooding just looks different all across the country. Uh, and overall, you can see on that, um, this slide or this image right here, extreme one day precipitation events in the contiguous 48 states um, from 1910 to 2015, you're seeing just a general increase in these severe rain events. But overall, while, while overall precipitation levels may decrease in parts of the country, heavy precipitation events in most parts of the United States have increased both in intensity and frequency since 1901. So that's actually coming from the uh, National Climate Assessment. Um, so there's just important regional differences with trends. 
um, largest increases are occurring in the northeastern states, but lots of regions are affected. Almost all regions have been affected in some way. Even here in Southern California, where nobody thinks we get rain, the rain events have become maybe less frequent, but more intense. Um, of course, these exacerbate uh, the flooding is exacerbated by sea level rise and earlier snowmelt, along with man-made changes to the landscape. Um, we see that these are all, you know, obviously it's contributing to landslides, mudslides, and erosion. Um, the number of 100-year floods in the contiguous United States um, is rising steadily, and it's continued to do so through the remainder of the century. So approximately twice as many flood events projected uh, RCP 8.5, do people know what that means? That just means a higher emission scenario. When we do projections, we're assuming, are we going to continue to emit a lot or a lot, lot, or just a, a lot? <laughs> and so it's so the worst case scenario, sort of twice as many flood events are projected um, by the end of the century. All right. So, uh, interesting. So, what health impacts might you? Might you predict? Well, of course, you're going to see some direct impacts to um, like injuries and deaths. So if you have some sort of a storm or flood, you might actually people just have people actually drowning. Flood, floods are actually one of the deadliest weather related events in the United States, second only to heat. And uh, in the U.S. inland, uh, flooding caused over 4,500 deaths between 1959 and 2005. Um, what you're seeing there on the right, this, you're going to see these kinds of charts a lot from us because we love our CDC, National Environmental Public Health Tracking um, tool. They are showing here number of people within FEMA designated flood hazard areas. Now we show it, but we know some of this data is not so good for tribes, doesn't capture as much tribal data as we wish it did, but it's still a useful thing to look at sort of a bigger scale. Mental health impacts, similar to what we've talked about as a disaster, similar to what we're talking about with wildfire. Intense at first lasts a long time, especially when we're talking about real damage. Uh, Flood-related mental health impacts are associated with direct and longer-term losses, social impacts, stress, and economic hardships. We also see, again, damage to the infrastructure that can limit access to health services. So, you know, this is why what, between wildfire and storms and flood, this is why for the transportation adaptation plan that we did, you know, access to health services was the number one concern. Power outages, they look like power outages, de-energization, road closures, damaged facilities like emergency facilities. And also we see in these big disaster, mass disaster events that emergencies can overwhelm health and emergency services. You just can't, even if you could get there, you might not get seen right away. So storms and flooding trigger the following secondary exposures. Um, so a surprising one you know, might not be thinking about is you know, in the long run, if you have flooding, especially in homes, you might be experiencing indoor mold, which is um, can create respiratory effects and other kinds of effects on the human body. Uh, it changes the distribution and breeding of mosquitoes. Um, you might see in the aftermath of a storm where there had been flooding, uh, higher levels of disease carrying vectors like mosquitoes. Uh, obviously water contamination, a lot of you probably are doing your own stormwater monitoring and you know the kinds of nitrates and other things that you would see in your water supply after a storm event, especially if it's severe. Um, and to the extent you've seen damage to any of your water distribution systems, um, water treatment uh, systems, you might actually have supply disruptions as well. Lots of health impacts to be anticipated here. Oops. Let's talk about it. So of course, I just mentioned the illness related to mold exposure, um, infectious and illness from contaminated food, um, marine food potentially, if you all are, uh, you know, for those that are still doing traditional fishing practices, with drinking water and food supply interruption, lack of nutritional and medicinal abundance and vector -borne, borne disease. You see that we're separating, right? There are exposures, which is what is happening that we cannot necessarily control out in the climate. And then what are, how does it impact us? So these impacts, we're talking, what is the actual health outcome? Well, it's, you know, disease. So there's, we could look at the cases of mosquito, disease carrying mosquitoes out there. And then we look at 
how many humans have actually been infected by that potential um, vector. Angie, I'm going to jump in here just for a second to say that we're getting a whole lot of stuff in the chat already answering the question about well-being and ways <clears throat> ways of life. I want to share one from from Dennis Longknife that uh, is just heartbreaking um, and not on our typical list, but that they had a wildfire on their reservation last year and tainted water from a gold mine was used to fill the retardant plains and those that water was dropped over tribal lands. Um, and this is this is tainted water being dropped on people's probably homes and places where they're raising food and hunting. Uh, but I also want to say, y'all, we're all here together to fight this, you know, because this litany, this list of, of negative effects, these terrible things, that's why we're all here, right? To be able to protect our families, our communities, um, you know, culture and land and people and places and animals. Um, so I don't want to, you know, draw, I don't want to leave for lunch in 15 minutes and have everybody be so depressed that they eat a dozen donuts, which is what I'll probably do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we're going to talk about we're going to talk about solutions and how we can all work together to, to help improve outcomes and, and make sure that that we make the change that needs to be made. So but go ahead and keep it's good to, too for you to share this stuff because I think sharing helps us kind of get some of that poison out of our system um, and be able to help one another with it. Yeah, you know, our approach with Tribal Climate Health Project, let's talk about it and then let's, yeah, let's, we know that we, with full knowledge, we can do something about it. It's very like, so the knowledge is tended to be empowering. If you don't know, you can't act. So we kind of ripped the Band-Aid off hard here at first because let's look at it with our eyes wide open what's going to come because we need to make some critical decisions um and like paula said you're not alone okay so some of that was repeated i'm going to move a little faster here into drought i wonder if this could be shown hooray <clears throat> this is just a nice graphic um showing how drought is changing this is a, a nasa graphic showing us by the end of the century, how um, the darker the brown, the higher the drought level of drought. So there Maybe you I'll go. I'll be dead by then. <laughs> <laughs> in, 20, in 2095, I'll be 124. I'm going to be. Yeah, there you positive. go. Silver lining. <laughs> all right. Well, you all know recent drought or water deficits have reached record, uh, reached a variety of records and in intensity in different parts of the country. Strong evidence that climate change increases. Um, evapotransportation and soil moisture deficits as well. And so it's one of the most pervasive climate induced weather exposures for tribes, uh, especially those in the Southwest and the Great Plains. Now, sorry, we're a little West heavy, um, but, but this is just what the research is showing us. Um, I'm sure you are already thinking of all the ways that your health is affected. However, um, it sounds a little unique. So possible health impacts, it's a slow one, right? Drought, you see drought coming. Um, you know, it's not sneaking up on you when you wake up. It's like a flood or a wildfire. It's gradual. And so, but it, it creates, you know, the biggest health impact, direct health impact is the mental health um, impacts related to anxiety, grief, helplessness. Those of you, if you're concerned about possible displacement, if there's just no water security left, um, economic changes, or insecurity, damage um, of the local environment. You, know, you see the viability of um, your natural resources, potentially your crops or your economic drivers depleting in front of you. That's um, a lot of anxiety. So we there's a, a resource here from Sam. Uh, did Angie freeze? Yep. Angie froze. So until she comes back to us, I'll I'll pick it up here. Thank you. Um, so yeah, you can see here what some of the uh, these warning signs are. And I think these these are not just related to drought. We can see them related to a lot of other things as well. Uh, but yeah, that feeling of anxiety and, and worry. Obviously, if there's a wildfire beating down your door or floodwaters lapping at your yard, you're going to feel anxious. But even with with drought, you know, we get that sense of 
when am, when am I going to turn on the tap and, and the water is not going to going to be there anymore. Um, and I don't know about the rest of you, but for me, growing up in the West, um, that's a constant source of, of anxiety for me. And when I was a little girl, my dad used to time our showers with an egg timer um, just so that he could get us to be more more thoughtful about about using our our water. Um, Serena's, are you able to put those slides back up? Because I know Angie was running the slides and I don't yes. have them on my end. I got them, I can put them up. Okay, thank you. Please stand by. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, let's do the next one. So, um, so I mean, and I think I'm, a lot of you have been doing this work for a while, so I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but uh, drought can sort of paradoxically end up contributing to uh, wildfire and storms and flooding. So here in, in San Diego in Paula, because of the drought there, the, the ground is drier, but it's harder. It gets really hard packed, the less water there is. And so then when a, when a storm does come, the storms tend to also be more intense and drop a lot more water. That's also a climate effect and they don't absorb into the ground in the same way that they used to. And so you end up getting a lot more flooding, uh, surface flooding, and you get a lot more erosion. I think I saw much earlier in the chat that uh, Kristen from Saboba mentioned the, uh, the erosion um, being exacerbated by drought, which when you're thinking drought, you're not thinking about erosion and flooding, but that's exactly what happens. And then what are some of the exposures? And like Angie was saying, a lot of it is going to be um, similar to what we've seen from the, the other exposures. Uh, increased dust, absolutely. And again, we experience that in Paula, any place that has dirt roads. Um, I like what Elroy put in the chat. He grew up in a home without running water on the Navajo Nation. So no, no showers to time at all. My sister and I were talking about this this last night, actually, Elroy, we were saying, why don't we go back to the where where people used to just uh, take a shower, you know, or take a bath once a week. And during the rest of the week, you just do, you know, you do the sensitive parts. And we all know what those are. You know, you don't have to be clean from head to toe. And, and that'll save some water. Um, Lori, you're mentioning subsidence. Yes, in the Central Valley of California some of the, the land has dropped 25 feet because of overdraft of the aquifers there. And it's just, it's just flattening the land there. So we're getting the dust, the allergens in, in the dust um, and the disruption to water supply. There are communities who do not have water and have to have it trucked in. Um, so there's a lot of different potential impacts that we're seeing from these, these drought exposures that piggyback onto what we're seeing from the other climate change exposures. And you guys can continue to put those health impacts that you've experienced um, in, in the chat. And uh, let's go to the next slide. Just I think so Ann, just so you Angie, know. are you back? I am. My computer got so depressed at everything and it shut down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to let you, I'm going to go ahead and let you pick it back up. Oh, good grief. Okay, so we're gonna, we don't have much longer anyways, we're kind of giving you a teaser just we want you to be thinking about your own, ex, you know, your own potential exposures and we're going to dive into it next. Um, health exposures of drought, we talked, you know, these are starting to become repetitive right Res respiratory and cardiovascular illness fever uh, valley fever this one is really. Um, this one of the research is it shows a strong correlation between drought and valley fever so um, these are the areas that you're seeing on the map that are actually endemic for this fungus that contributes to valley fever. Again, sorry, West, um, but we've got some problems there. Vector-borne diseases, so not just mosquitoes, but we're talking about hantavirus as well. We hear about that with some of our Southern California tribes, rodents, um, carried by rodents. Of course, drinking water supply uh, interruption and water security issues. We're gonna look at this, actually Tribal Climate Health Project is going to look at water security in California in its next round. Um, hopefully if we get awarded with um, some additional funding. And then, you know, we've been talking about lack of nutritional medicinal abundance. It matters, it matters that our, our plants can survive. Okay. I think somebody else is controlling slides now. All right. 
So these are these are all the same kinds of uh, impacts to social, economic, and cultural health and well-being. Again, potential for migration and displacement, uh, disruptions to culturally important activities. In this case, potentially fishing uh, might be one. Lost school days and business closures, economic damage. So we're talking about agricultural losses. In California, our climate assessment tells us that water shortages could cost up to $1 billion a year, and those are just in agricultural costs. Lots of additional ways that well-being, cultural well-being and life can be disrupted by drought. I think this is a, it's just a tricky one. This one's harder to get your, your head around. It's long. Um, the data is tough to get. Um, but I think the dev is, I think this is one of the biggest threats to the tribes that are going to be impacted. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, animals, thank you. So Mel, this is our um, last one, I believe, melting ice and sea level rise, particularly pertinent to those of us uh, here from Alaska. Um, so in general, rising temperatures are increasing ocean water mass. So there's a couple different ways that sea level rise happens. Um, not only does the ocean water mass, when it increases in temperature, does it uh, rise, but also volume, meaning thermal expansion. So the volume of the water when warmer is actually expanded. So that's why you're seeing sea level rise in a couple of different ways. So the ice is melting and, and, the, and thermal expansion is happening. Um, and so the global mean sea level has risen about seven to eight inches since 1900. So it's happening. Um, we're going to show you some tools that you can use to actually see if you are on the coast, what the sea level rise projections might be um, in different scenarios. So obviously this is going to contribute to storm surges and coastal flooding. So there's a relationship with floods, which I already talked about. And it's also going to trigger um, some of the, you know, some effects to um, secondary exposures. So there's a relationship to things like vectors, obviously water security to the extent that saltwater inundation affects water systems. Um, so what kind of health impacts can you anticipate? And actually, yeah, give us a thumbs up if, if melting ice and sea level rise has affected your tribe or a fire or a sad face or whatever it is you like to share. All right, next slide, please. So, you know, one of the interesting things around this one that we have heard examples of is that when the permafrost and ice melts, thins, uh, and thaws, we see ice-related injuries for the communities that are that are on that kind of an environment. So and that has impacts to its hunting and fishing practices. Um, and if hunting and fishing practices are affected, then you might see some impacts to food security and nutritional abundance, um, of course, mental health impacts. And then on the other side, It'll be really interesting to see what prehistoric diseases continue to be unearthed out of that ice. Next slide, please. I mean, this one's really major when it comes to displacement. So social, economic, and cultural health. How are the tribes on the coast of Alaska going to continue to survive if the year, if their coastlines are eroding, if they're seeing inundation? And it's already happening. We know that at least 30 villages in Alaska are already at risk of um, not being able to continue to live on their lands and considering relocation. And I hope that the tribes that are here today experiencing that will have a chance to tell us what that means for them. And I'll All just right. add too that um, this, the melting ice and sea level rise, it's not just a coastal impact. Um, I learned from last August being in Alaska and hearing from tribal folks there that it's also um, erosion and um, rivers and lakes that would normally be frozen during certain times of year, not being frozen enough to use as a traditional road, you know, a way to get into and out of places um, and erosion in terms of being able to access hunting grounds or berries, be being able to get to your berry picking grounds where the paths have all eroded away because of ice flow or melt from glaciers and, and that sort of thing is, is uh, even on the inland tribes is having an impact. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. I think we're about to wrap this section up. Next slide, please. Oh, there we go. You know, the last thing on that last slide is um, I'm working on an adaptation plan for a tribe who's got ancestral lands that they are that go to the coast, they are very inland, 
right? Because that's how the lines got drawn. But their coastal and uh, their cultural resources are oftentimes on the coast. So we're having to look at a broader boundary. It really becomes interesting when we really start diving into vulnerability assessments, which we'll do later on today. Let's stop here. Now, I apologize for that being a lot and it being hard to hear sometimes. But I think all of you are, are here because you want to do something about it. So um, we believe that you can. And we're going to talk about that more. We're going to I want to invite you to look at page 19 of your participant workbook where you have an opportunity to reflect on what we've gone through already this morning. And now we have a chance to have a break for lunch. Um, go to the next slide, please. So if you want, you can go grab some food and come back and chat. If we want to set up little um, side conversations and breakout rooms, we can. But um, consider this a little networking lunch or if you need time to yourself, take it. I'm going to go get some food and be back. We have an hour for lunch, and then we're going to come back at 1245 for two hours of really interactive um, conversation.